Well, we are walking to a new historic site, and I promise, this time, and this time only, it is not a cannon. Though it's made of cannons, so I'm not sure if that counts. We are here in St. James's Park in London, and we are on our way to Waterloo Place. I am Daryl with FTG, the Ministry for History, known in genteel circles as the Lord Rivers. I'm sure many of you know me in one accent or another. Many of you have asked me, dude, where's your accent? And as many of you know, if I'm in a historic character, I usually put on my English accent if I'm portraying an Englishman. I will put on my American accent if I'm portraying an American. And today, since you're just getting Daryl the historian, it's just gonna be normal me. I grew up in California, and my family's from Boston, so I don't even know what my real accent is. I say certain things funny, but bear with me. Particularly as I will sound abysmally American when talking about British history. So we're on our way to Waterloo Place, but the last one I'm gonna talk about in St. James's is actually this monument to the artillerymen of the Boer War. Um, between 1899 and 1902, the two Boer republics rebelled against the British, declared war against Britain, and the artillerymen who died from either disease or from the Boers with their German Mausers um, are honored here. And so that's just an interesting little tidbit that isn't quite Waterloo Place, but we're gonna do it while we're on our way there. Shockingly, no one told me, it is wet and rainy and windy in England. Who knew? So we'll see if any of this audio survives. Now, Frederick Duke of York was the second son of George III, and he held various military commands during his life, including commander-in-chief of the army during pivotal years in the Napoleonic Wars. The first commands he held as a general were in the French Revolutionary Wars, pre-Napoleon, and he served in a number of campaigns on the continent including one in Flanders that he basically considered everything not to do. Um, he, he considered his experiences, few as they were, as pivotal for understanding what needed to be reformed in the British Army. And so his legacy is on reform for the British Army. And you can see he has quite a big column here. It was resented at the time, though, because although he did quite a bit for uh, British, the British military, and I believe he set up people like Wellington for success, I believe a lot of his reforms were absolutely necessary to the success of the Peninsular Campaign um, and a number of others, um, but his monument was resented because although there were attempts to raise money in parliament and there were attempts to raise money from uh, people all over the country when they couldn't find the money they just docked the soldiers pay and throughout the army there were stoppages for the duke of york's column and um that didn't go over particularly well among the common soldiers particularly when the Duke of York was resented because he didn't particularly get his commands based off of merit. It was because he was the king's son. And that's how you rise from, um, rise immediately to general, and then from one of the most junior generals in the British Army to commander-in-chief of the forces. It was good that he replaced the commander-in-chief of the forces, though, because the previous commander was Jeffrey Amherst, who was the commander and architect of the Seven Years' War in the 1750s. So, needing a little bit of an update. 
So yes, this is the grand old Duke of York who had 10,000 men and marched them up to the top of the hill and marched them down again. So, um, not particularly a favorite, and, and not a particular favorite among most Londoners I know, because it's a, uh, it is a rather stocky column, and he's so high up you can't really, really see him that well. Um, it's, it's not the best monument in the world, uh, but it is interesting for the history behind it. And here is the, here's the view from the bottom, which you can barely see. Well, you actually can't see the Duke at the top there. And here is the plaque for Frederick Duke of York, 1763 to 1827. He was the second son of George III, commander-in-chief of the British Army from 1709, or 1795 to 1809, and then a brief break for political reasons between 1809 and 1811, and then until his death in 1827. Now with the Duke of York column behind us, we are going to move into Waterloo Place, and Waterloo Place is known for its clubs. Over here, the Athenaeum with the statue of Athena there and the gardens behind. Through those trees is actually the reform and behind me here is what was originally the United Service Club and which is now the Institute of Directors. The first statue that we're going to properly talk about is rather controversial because anything involving the British Raj is controversial, but first we're going to talk about John, First Lord Lawrence. And Lawrence is interesting to me because he played a role in the Indian Rebellion in 1857 and was eventually made Viceroy of India. But he's an interesting figure because he's one of the only people that comes out of um, the Indian Rebellion with his reputation intact because he was key in keeping the Punjab on, on side, on the British side um, during the rebellion. Now the rebellion begins with the Sepoy Mutiny um, during the, the spark for which, and we've talked about this ad nauseum before on this channel, if you've listened to um, any of Brett and I's deep dives on musketry, but cartridges were issued for the new rifle muskets that were greased. And that grease was rumored to have pork or beef tallow, um, either of which being um, offensive to Muslims and Hindus, respectively. And although there were attempts made to correct that, um, there were, there was insistence on mutton tallow. There were even offers to send the cartridges ungreased and the soldiers would uh, grease them themselves. The rumor couldn't be shaken off. And so even if soldiers knew that there was no beef or pork tallow on those cartridges, society thought, Indian society, um, had fully... Uh, drunken that rumor, and you can you can read um, accounts from these very frustrated soldiers in um, Brett's book, The English Cartridge, which I'll I'll put a link in the description about how even though they knew that the cartridge was not offensive, they could not remove that stigma, and so when they would be you know, forced to use that cartridge, train with that cartridge, use that cartridge, um, society would consider them outcasts. And so rather than subjecting themselves to that, a, m a number of Indian units in British service rebelled. Um, and that is the mutiny that sparks the greater Indian rebellion. 
in the Indian Rebellion um, lasts quite a while and has a number of different campaigns. But different portions of India stayed with or fought against the British. And uh, John, First Lord Lawrence, was key in keeping the Punjab um, for Britain. And for anyone really interested in a deep dive on the Raj, I highly recommend um, The Anarchy by uh, Dalrymple. Uh, it's a new uh, perspective, a new scholarship on uh, the Raj, particularly in the early history of the East India Company. Um, the other figure that's actually right next to him here also is made famous by the Indian Rebellion, but we know him um, on this channel uh, for his service in Crimea. And it is Sir Colin Campbell, also known as the Lord Clyde. So here's Sir Colin Campbell, tiny as he was, up there. And this angry Scotsman was key um, at the Battle of Balaclava, commanding the Highlanders to use their new rifle muskets rather than forming a square, which was the traditional response to cavalry, he knew the new capabilities of the rifle musket were profound. And so he had his men open up at long range and then closer, picking off uh, Russian cavalrymen as they advanced on um, the British troops. And he, he, with infantry, with that thin red line of soldiers, um, halted a uh, Russian cavalry attack. And his service continued in the Crimean War. He commanded a division at the attack on the Great Redan. And he also continued his service into the Indian Rebellion, where he relieved the siege of Lucknow and then went on to have to capture Lucknow again. Um, he has a number of battles where he's in command, um, and there's a lot of really uh, interesting paintings showing uh, Colin Campbell in India that I'll put up. Now, the next figure we're going to talk about, I'm going to jump to the other side of the road here, is John Fox Burgoyne. And for my American audience, Burgoyne will ring a bell because uh, Burgoyne, this man's father, uh, was actually uh, the, command, the British commander at Saratoga that surrendered rather flamboyant figure and um, one of the key figures in the American War of Independence. But John Fox Burgoyne, his son, was made famous during the Crimea, and he is renowned among the Royal Engineers. He was the superintendent of Royal Engineers, and he commanded the engineers in the Crimean War. Now, the engineers are always renowned in military circles and uh, this was no different in the Crimea. Um, as chief engineer, Burgoyne was a key advisor to Lord Raglan, who was in command. Do you see the Russian army, my lord? Good morning, sir. And when it came to when the army crossed the river at the Alma and Sevastopol was before them, he recommended that they settle in for a siege and slowly and methodically with as little blood as possible, slowly take Sevastopol rather than just gunning for a, uh, an assault on the city. Um, it was expected that they would, they would take something like 500 casualties and that was simply too much. Uh, instead, they prolonged the war largely by um, Burgoyne's recommendation, many years and many thousands of lives. I'm always a little saddened by Burgoyne because of um, he and Raglan deciding to go with a prolonged siege in Sebastopol rather than going for the assault. And of course, he becomes pivotal to 
the um, campaign in Crimea because as they're settling in for the siege, that now becomes the demands of the engineers because miles and miles of trenches needed to be dug, positions for artillery, um, all kinds of siege works over the next uh, two years needed to be used. Now we're going to go across the clubs here and we see the reform behind me through there and a cawing friend of ours in the trees. Now all the way over here, sidelined like the real historical figure and another extremely controversial um, ruler of India during the Raj, Lord Curzon. And Lord Curzon was Viceroy of India around the turn of the century. He was foreign secretary um, in the 1920s. He was a member of Lloyd George's war cabinet, a very small circle. Um, he um, had a major series of conflicts with Kitchener. Um, he was such an influential figure in early 20th century British politics, and he was definitely slated to be uh, prime minister in um, the 1920s, but he was sidelined for Stanley Baldwin, and um, he it remains a controversial figure not only for his for his policies, but for his work as Viceroy of India, wherein, like John Lawrence and like Churchill, his mismanagement and the mismanagement of people under his leadership led to the death of millions and the Indian famine under his rule um, led to between one and five million deaths. So he remains an extremely controversial figure and for anyone interested in hearing more about him, I'm going to put a few books down in the description. And I think that Waterloo Place for me, is just a an ode to sadness and an ode to to the pains that people endure for each other. Not necessarily the pains that are inflicted on people, you know, the the ravages of war, but all of these figures um, endured things for others, and I think that's one of the reasons why I have such an attachment to it, aside from just the Crimean War Memorial. Um, so we are going to go continue on our way. Now I'm not going to let you down on my promise to make everything a bit melancholy today, because today we are also going to visit Jiro, who died in 1934. Ein treuer a true companion. Um, he was the dog of the German ambassador at the time, and uh, everyone calls it the Nazi dog because of that, but uh, the ambassador at the time was not a Nazi and was actually a, an opponent of Hitler's. But Giro, who was his dog, ended up chewing through some electrical wires one day, and he died in London and is buried here and his gravestone is still there. So that's always very sad. Giro, ein treuer Begleiter.